RAF Bomber Command planned thousands of bombing missions on military and industrial targets. One key area was the Ruhr Valley, known to the RAF as Happy Valley. A bombing raid was very dangerous work. Thousands of men got killed and many became prisoners of war. Well, uh, before you, uh, you go into the briefing room, you would have seen uh, or order of battle posted in the message. Once the order of battle was posted, the uh, station was sealed off. There was nobody could get in or out of the station and the, all communication was cut off except the scrambler line from Bomber Command to the intelligence officer. So you, you went to the briefing room and normally the navigator and bombing her would have been uh, approximately an hour before the rest of the crew. This was because you had to plot all the um, tracks and work out the times and so on and so forth. So you got into the briefing room, which is a very large room, and uh, tables running across it, and each crew had a, a separate table, quite a big long table. Uh, to allow you to spread out your charts and maps and so on. On the wall in front of you was the uh, huge map showing all of Europe and uh, the intelligence officer had already put up tips uh, of the route you were going. You never flew direct to a, a target. You uh, varied it different ways and approached different cities or towns and then turned off and went so on. You didn't start uh, plotting from your base. You never showed your base on your charts or maps. So that if uh, it fell into German hands, they wouldn't know where you had arrived from. Intelligence officer would have got up and he would have told you that uh, the Germans have just moved uh, huge batteries of guns from uh, Happy Valley, the Ruhr, they've moved it to somewhere else, uh, which always caused a bit of a laugh because <laughs> nobody believed him in the slightest. Uh, we had the to wait on taking off time. And then we'd climb into the aircraft and make it along to the runway, one after the other. And that was a, a telling time because looking out of the window, you could see the the wafts of the and various people waving to us as we flew as we made to the runway and took off. And there was a navigation table up just behind the pilot, surrounded by curtains so that they could have the navigation light on and flying over enemy territory. And uh, uh, the aircraft was comfortable enough on takeoff, but by the time you were at, at height 16,000 feet, it was pretty chilly. There was a heating system, but it was very, very, very primitive. It was extremely noisy. As a, when we would take off, we would circle the aerodrome, and as I, would, I would describe it as being like a, like a swarm of gnats in the summer air. And then at a certain time, we'd, set course for the uh, English coast. Well, we weren't uh, all together. This was, there was four or 500 planes. We'd be covering maybe a region of two or three miles wide and five to 10 miles long. I informed the bomb member of the direction of this bombing run. It was like, I don't know, Dante's Inferno. And it was really a, a dreadful sight. It was quite awe inspiring. We see some of it on television, by films nowadays. But to see it in actuality, it was, it was horrifying. You had a four minute time to be on the target. So we'd be moving from a high flying aircraft to low flying aircraft. And very quickly, the anti aircraft guns would be shifted from the high to the low again. They moved very, they were very well, very accurate in their firing. Where you had to go 
absolutely steadily flying straight and level and be a period of maybe a minute or two minutes as the bombing would be lying his down in the front of the aircraft well, over his bomb site, guiding the pilot in by you know, left, left, right, skipper steady now, and he'd be prompting the pilot always to keep on a very steady course. At least he would be over the target, and then he would say bombs away when he'd released them all. All hell let loose, shall we say, in the sky around me, and. Uh, I would set on the pilot's compass the new course out of the target, which you could fly as soon as the bomb ever had set bombs away and the photo flash had gone off. I always took a photograph of the, of the uh, bombs being dropped. Yes, uh, you have to admire the German fighters. They actually flew in among their own, their own flak to, after an aircraft. Very often looking around the sky, you'd see an aircraft combed in searchlights. They worked in huge batches of 20 or 30 searchlights. When one searchlight found an aircraft in the sky, the others would automatically go bang right onto it. It's a frightening experience to be combed by, by searchlight. Because within 20 seconds, you'd be shot down. The aircraft was hit and the pilot went into a sudden dive. Now, I, th I thought the pilot had been hit and I got on the intercom to him, but there was no reply. So then I was convinced that the, aircraft, that the pilot was dead. Uh, we were uh, descending very fast and I thought, well, the only thing for me to do is get out. I tried to get out, but uh, unfortunately I got uh, uh, hindered by the guns I had and I couldn't get out so I then just decided to wait for the crash so I thought that was the end but we were almost on the ground he pulled out, he was just doing a vis action we pulled out and then eventually uh, we were almost out of petrol so one engine had gone we had two, there were two engines in the Hamden one engine had gone and he decided to land in the sea. So he landed in the sea, a pretty good landing he made too. Now, this was rather unusual for him because my pilot was known as Bouncer. He just landed about 10 feet up and then bounced to a stop. But he didn't do that in the sea. He made a three-point landing in the sea. We all got out anyhow and got into the dinghy. Uh, the dinghy, I noticed the dinghy, the water was cl uh, climbing up the side of the dinghy. So I noticed the dinghy had something wrong. And eventually, the dinghy were turned. We all went into the water. We still held on to the dinghy because it kept, kept us all together, and there's still a little bit of inflation in it. Uh, but Ermey West saved us. That's her life jacket. Then we were... Uh, we'd, uh, I still didn't know. And nobody knew where we were. But we knew where we were when a, a ship came along, say, flying the swastika. I knew something desperate had gone wrong. Then the, 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 when the ship came alongside us, uh, threw out a rope, and we all agreed that we wouldn't let the dinghy go until everybody had got, got the rope. Uh, the pilot couldn't swim, I couldn't swim. So we needed to get hold of something. Uh, I got hold of the rope, and I started, as I imagine, climbing in. But I felt that the Germans were letting the rope out and obviously all they wanted to do was drown us. So we were told on one, on one occasion that if you ever land in the sea and you feel that you must drown, the quickest way to do it is to open your mouth, let the water in and get the water into your lungs and you'll die quickly that way. So I decided this was again my last course. And I opened my mouth to take in the water, but I must have had my eyes closed that particular time because I opened my eyes as well, and I was on the top of the water, literally. Gave myself an odd pull and I was out. Now, by the time I got on the boat, well, I didn't know, I didn't uh, remember being getting on the boat because I was unconscious before, before that time. And then I woke up 
and there's a German standing over me with a big knife. And this is when he looked down on me and said, for you, the war is over, so. <laughs> and, and I thought, what, then it was definitely over.